Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series. Tonight, our special guest, Larry Summers, who's been a guest of Folks two times in the past. Um, we've had him uh, live at the 92nd Street Y twice, and now we have him live virtually, the new format. I can tell you that when I introduced him those prior times, I always used to say, you know, when you're in a room and Larry Summers there, it's usually the case that he's the smartest person in the room. But this is a little different. We're online and it's a global audience. And I know for sure he's the smartest guy on camera, uh, but he may ultimately be the smartest guy that's even watching tonight. Uh, we know Larry as a former Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration. Uh, he was the director of the National Economic Council uh, for Barack Obama and was essentially brought in to rescue our economy from the subprime mortgage crisis of 2007, 2008, and is widely credited with coming up with the theories that actually pulled us out of that crisis. And of course, he's a former president at Harvard University where he now teaches. Um, if, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, welcome. Uh, we love having you. Uh, also, why don't you at some point go to folks.org and sign up for our email blast, even though I know that on your YouTube channel, you all, our YouTube channel, you also receive advance notice of our events. Um, and if you have a question for Larry, uh, you can leave it in the Q&A box and hopefully we'll have some time. Uh, this is an auspicious time to have uh, Larry Summers. Uh, the Federal Reserve just yesterday announced a interest rate hike was not unexpected. Uh, today, the uh, CEO of JP Morgan announced in a testimony before Congress that we should prepare for the worst. That's pretty ominous. Uh, everyone is aware of stock market volatility, of rising inflation. We have a COVID winter upon us, and that's never been good for us the last two years. Supply chain issues, rising fuel prices, and Larry Summers to help make sense of this for us. Larry, welcome. Thank you for joining us again. Very good. To, very good to be with you, Dane. Um, so the rate hike yesterday, uh, we know that you had been critical of the central bank in acting too slowly in responding to inflation. And, and as, as usual, you were right. Uh, they were not as alarmist. And I think they might have thought that you were and you thought that rates should be hiked. Uh, this is now, I think yesterday was the fifth one. Uh, are, we, are we there yet? Do you think that the hikes should even be more? And can, if they could be higher, is there a reason to keep them more measured as opposed to doing them in one shot? Uh, look, Thane, I, I was of the view that the Fed was way behind the curve last year and early uh, this year that the judgment to be buying mortgages in the midst of a housing market that was on fire was very hard for me to understand. Which, what, what they, was most alarming? What is it that you picked on most? Was it, was it rising wages? Because I know you've talked about, is it housing costs? What, what was the one that really in your mind triggered? But going back, it was initially the very substantial level of fiscal stimulus. And then it was what was happening to wages. And then it, what was happening to tightness in the labor market as measured by vacancies relative to uh, unemployment. So I've been gratified to see the Fed trying to uh, catch up and raising rates uh, significantly to see as I had been recommending, to see the Fed um, recognize that it's ultimately going to have to raise rates by more than the increases we've seen in uh, inflation to have any chance of applying restrictive policy, to recognize that you don't achieve disinflation without any distress. I've felt it was important for them to recognize that, not because I'm indifferent to distress or because I welcome distress, but I think their ability to be credible in being committed to containing inflation depends upon their projecting 
that they have an honest awareness of the consequences of uh, their policy. And I think on all of that, they have moved substantially uh, in the right direction. My judgment is uh, that they've got more to go, that their current forecast, which is that it will be possible to bring inflation back to their target level with unemployment only reaching four and a half percent represents an extremely optimistic view, not a reasonable best guess. And I emphasize this again, not because I want to see unemployment higher, but because I want to see the Fed as credible as possible, because the more credible the Fed is, the lower the costs will be of winning uh, this war against uh, inflation. So my suspicion is unemployment will have to rise uh, with less confidence. My best guess is that rates are going to have to ultimately be somewhat higher than uh, the Fed now guesses. And if they're wrong, will they know soon enough that they can self-correct? In other words, if they're not seeing it the way you're seeing it, and they're not prepared to raise rates to a level that you think is necessary, or if unemployment does not reach the numbers that you think could fix the economy, even with some pain, <clears throat> but ultimately would be necessary, <clears throat> uh, what would have to happen for them to go, oh my God, Larry Summers is right again? I think they're watching the economy carefully and they're adjusting and they've made important adjustments, both in their policy, very strong increases in uh, interest rates. They've made adjustments in their forecasts of how much the interest rate is going to go up, need to go up. And they've made adjustments in the direction of reality by recognizing the ways in which uh, they're going to uh, cause dislocations in the economy. So and that's a process that can continue. And they've also made clear that nothing's locked in stone and mm. they're going to be looking at the data. And I've welcomed the strength of Chairman Powell's commitment uh, to do what's necessary uh, to reduce inflation. I think that the more strength with which they project uh, that commitment, the less expensive it will be uh, to achieve. And given that expense here is measured in terms of extra unemployment, I think that's an extremely important objective. So can you help explain why is it, it seems, I mean, you seem to be right, but economics seems it's, it's like a math equation. Why is it so hard to forecast? Why doesn't there seem to be more consensus? In a few minutes, we'll talk a little about the Volcker years, but why isn't this more, I mean, yes, of course you won the Bates medal, Bates Clark medal, so your math skills are better. But those of us who are not economics people think, well, wait a minute, aren't these graphs, aren't these just numbers? Can't you just put them into some algorithm or something, some equation, and you know what to do? Why is it that there are disparate thinking on how to correct the economy? So the first part of the answer is that the economy is an enormously complex system and complex systems are hard to forecast. We still don't do so well predicting uh, the weather uh, two, hour, <laughs> two, uh, two days out. We don't do so well predicting which days there are going to be big traffic jams and which days there are not going to be uh, big uh, traffic jams. We don't predict successfully uh, changes in uh, fashion or who's going to win football games. So complex systems are just hard to predict. That's the first part of the answer. And the second part of the answer, Thane, is that complex systems that involve human behavior huh. and that involve an element of what George Soros called reflexivity, that 
what people think affects what happens. You know, what people think about the trajectory of a Frisbee doesn't affect what the trajectory of a Frisbee is. Hmm. Whether people are confident about avoiding recession or not affects how much they spend, which in turn affects what the chance of a recession are. So when you have complex systems that are about human behavior with reflexivity, it's always going to be hard to uh, predict. And predictions are always going to be judgments. And I think the evidence is that the people who take the most Catholic set of views and look at a lot of different factors tend to be more right in their predictions than the people who are dogmatically tied to a specific statistical uh, model. But um, I think prediction is always going to be difficult. And much of the challenge of policy is to design policies that are robust, even if your predictions don't turn out to be exactly right. So I was thinking Mo, when you said human behavior and I thought to myself, I wonder if the people that accepted the stimulus checks and weren't looking for jobs and just went off and spent money and helped to overheat the economy, right? I mean, it's interesting, like no one actually was thinking I'm contributing to inflation, right? The, the things that ultimately overheated our economy are things that people just did, human behavior, but it's not something that people were aware. That's why when you said a moment ago, I wonder whether, you know, I'm thinking in terms of ending, it, uh, uh, you know, pushing us away from a recession. It is interesting to think about how many complex decisions ultimately go into changing those graphs. Let me read something to you that you wrote a little, just a little over a year ago. And you were right. It's that you wrote excessive inflation and a sense of it was not being controlled, was not being controlled, helped elect Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and risks bringing Donald Trump back to power. While an overheating economy is a relatively good problem to have compared to a pandemic or a financial crisis, it will metastasize and threaten prosperity and public trust unless clearly acknowledged and addressed. So I'm wondering, it seems to me, I, I could be wrong, that even government leaders don't take inflation as seriously as they do high unemployment numbers, right? That, that inflation, even though we talked about rising fuel prices and baby formula, you know, rising prices matter, but I'm wondering whether the, there's a reason why we dismiss inflation or undervalue it, or am I wrong? Because it seems that so much of your writing has been about responding to pie in the sky, overly optimistic conclusions, right? As if, oh, we can curb inflation. You just said it a moment ago that the government, they think they can do it with under 6% unemployment. And you're, I can tell in your face, you're saying, you gotta be kidding. I mean, you can believe that if you want to, but it's not gonna happen. Why is it that we don't see inflation in the same way? So I think there are a couple aspects uh, to that. One is that um, inflation's like uh, the hangover and <laughs> stimulus is like the drink. And when you're enjoying the uh, drink, <laughs> do not focus on uh, the hangover. And so there's always a temptation to overstimulate economies and think uh, that that will work. And just as you're more likely to make the mistake of drinking too much and having a hangover, if you haven't had the experience in a long time, the fact that we've successfully avoided inflation for a long time has dulled memories and led to complacency, which I think uh, contributed uh, to these uh, policy, uh, policy errors. Well, maybe because there's also that the prescriptions are just too painful. And so political leaders are worried about um, if we do what's necessary, 
we're going to get killed in the next election because the 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 medicine for inflation is just really a, a bitter pill. I think there certainly are uh, are elements of that where it's you know one of those problems uh, where people decide you know they can. They can quit their bad habit. They can quit their bad habit next week, not this week, mm-hmm. um, and then next week, and then next week, and then the habit gets harder to quit. I think there certainly are elements of that in understanding inflation. Look, there's a big difference between our situation right now, Thane, and our situation in the 1970s, which is right now people are expecting inflation over the near term. But they're not expecting that much inflation over the long term. In the 1970s, they were expecting inflation forever. That's a respect in which things are a good deal better now. But, but, but Larry, but wasn't it won't stay that way forever. Right. And if we let inflation continue too much longer and we don't seem like we're intensely focused on it, then people are going to start building in. Uh, inflation expectations in a much stronger way. And if that happens, it's going to be much more expensive to deal with inflation. So, but inflation in 1979, when Volcker came to the Federal Reserve, and as you, I I don't know whether you would say Thane, in 1979, no one realized how long term, I'm sorry, at that point, they had experienced inflation throughout the entire decade, right? So they were looking for someone to help them get out of it. But inflation, Larry, in 1979 was 11%, right? And today it's what, eight, I think, percent. So I, I again, I don't know how significant that is, you know, for, as an economist, you're saying, Thane, there's a huge difference between 11 and eight. I mean, 11 is just huge. Was it 11 the entire 1970s? No. And do no. we have a chance? Do you imagine that if we don't raise rates, if we don't go into recession, if we don't have more unemployment, we can reach 11? So I would say um, a couple things. Uh, One is that for various technical reasons, they compute the indices differently now. And so the difference is a little less than 11 versus eight if you compute the index in the same way. Uh, Does anyone second, know that? Because that's serious. You're it's, saying it's, it's known, actually it's, it's worse it's known than it. by the uh, cognoscenti uh, in I this see. world. I don't know that it's the stuff of street corner uh, conversation. I'm not sure it should be the stuff of street corner. <laughs> I won't tell anybody. Street corner conversation. I think there's also um, a difference, as you say, that inflation had gone on for a long time in the 1970s. Could it happen if we? make mistakes? Yeah, we could. I mean, the Britain may well have a number of months of inflation above 15%. And three years ago, they were as securely a low inflation country as we are. So could it happen? Yes. Do I expect that it will happen? No, because I think the Federal Reserve belatedly, but clearly, is uh, recognizing uh the gravity of uh, the problem. I think the fallacy that we really need to be careful of is there are a lot of people, uh, even some prominent uh, economists who argue, well, inflation expectations are anchored. They're not getting out of control. Therefore, it's all gonna be okay. Therefore, we don't need to do anything. Well, I would argue the only reason they are angry is because the Fed has brought about a revolution in its policy I see. in the last four months. And so to take the consequences of that policy as evidence for the lack of need for that policy is, it seems to me, a pretty straightforward fallacy. But it's important to remember that when vo- the four years that Volcker brought inflation from 11 percent to 4 percent, I think I, I hope I'm I have this right. I don't know if I have this right. The country fell into recession twice and that employ and unemployment was over six percent. So I mean that just seems extraordinary over a four-year period to to actually cure the country of inflation 
we went through two recessions and had unemployment over 6%. And I suspect there was also stock market volatility. I'm sure all of that was happening. Is that something that you can imagine we were heading toward? Well, I, I need to correct you in one important respect, Dave. Um, during the Volcker disinflation, unemployment reached 10.8%. Oh, my God. So you had a really quite extraordinary situation. Oh, wow. With unemployment of 10.8%. Uh, now, when, can I just say I, one important question? He knew he was doing that. Did he see that? Did he see that as a good outcome in the way that you think that higher unemployment would help us? I, I want to be clear. I, I, no one should ever say they think high unemployment is good. A good outcome. <laughs> right. High unemployment is a terrible uh, outcome, and it is a terrible outcome that is visited most on those who are least able uh, to bear it. There is nothing good to be said about uh, unemployment. However, it is a feature of sufficiently restrictive policy to contain inflation that it is likely to have as a byproduct um, a unfortunately high level of uh, unemployment. And that is uh, the right way to think about it. I mean, it could take a very unpleasant uh, analogy for a variety of kinds of illnesses, chemotherapy is necessary. Right. And a sufficiently strong dose of chemotherapy is likely to cause the patient to feel sick. And so resolving the problem is likely to require the patient to feel sick. That doesn't mean that the objective of policy is to make the patient feel sick. That doesn't mean that the uh, sickness is not a problem or that the sickness is a thing to be welcomed. It's just a fact about the situation that the necessary curative has a unfortunate consequence. So I read that's somewhere- That's how I would think of, that's the way in which- To I understand think about unemployment. inflationary policy. I don't think there's any reason based on where we are now that the policy needs to be consequential at the level that uh, the Volcker uh, era policies were. I think if we delay sufficiently, that kind of extreme action might become necessary, but I think we can avoid that. But that doesn't mean we can't, we can avoid any distress. And I think it's welcome that Chairman Powell is increasingly in his statements recognizing uh, that reality. So this is in the spirit of what I I think I've read you say that recession is better than long-term permanent inflation, right? Isn't that in the spirit of that? That that's another key. Yeah, benefit? but I would put it differently. There is no such thing as stable long-term permanent inflation. Six percent inflation becomes eight percent inflation becomes ten uh, percent inflation, and then you ultimately need a much larger and much more painful uh, recession. Uh, to uh, bring it under control. Right, but it also accounts for why, although we can't dismiss 10% inflation, it might explain why Volcker's remedies seem to be so radical because the, the, the patient was really ill in 1979. The patient was really ill, and if we had acted more strongly with respect to inflation during the 1970s, we would have had less total pain and distress along the way. Instead, we deferred dealing with inflation because we explained that inflation was caused by special factors. We talked about a whole range of transitory factors. We blamed it on supply developments rather than on macroeconomic policies. 
we shuddered at the consequences of possible recession and therefore avoided uh, contractionary uh, policy, restrictive uh, policy. And that's what we did during the 1970s that made a significant problem into a huge problem. And my hope is that we will avoid making those mistakes this time around. And as I've been saying, we were moving in the direction of making those mistakes for quite a while during 2020 and early into 2021. Policy has started moving, but I think it's going to have to move more. But I guess some people would say, yeah, you know, yes, Professor Summers, except that the 1970s didn't have a worldwide pandemic, right? That maybe you could say there was something very unique about this, that the economic stimulus package was there to address this, you know, incredible time in world history. And certainly in the United States where, you know, people were sheltering at home and there was an enormous concern about the supply side. And there was this idea to stimulate the demand side. So we just gave people money. I wonder whether there, I mean, clearly that factors into this, but does that make it because of the, 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 the perfect storm that took place, right? A whole number of things happened, right? The invasion of Ukraine, the, so the destabilizing of the oil markets. It seems to me that a lot of unique things took place here that I don't know have the same parallel of the 70s. There are certainly unique things that have happened and there are all, we, history doesn't repeat itself, it, it rhymes. <laughs> and there are always uh, unique factors in every situation. In the 1970s, you had massive increases in oil prices, much more than we've seen here. In uh, the context of the OPEC cartel, you had major drying up of agricultural, uh, pro agricultural production. You had a substantial war uh, in uh, the uh, Middle East. Mm -hmm. So, there are always major uh, developments and no decade is an exact template for another decade. I think with respect to the specific factors you made, I was a strong supporter of trillions of dollars of COVID support during 2020 uh, after COVID hit for exactly the reasons you uh, suggest. I think the question was once COVID had hit and mm. once we had vaccines, once the economy was opening up and returning to normal, did we need stimulus far in excess of the gap between the economy's demand and supply? And my judgment at the time, and I, I have to say, I think it's been borne out by subsequent events, was that we did not need stimulus that was so large. And that by creating demand that was huge relative to supply, we were putting uh, stability uh, at risk. And that was my- So the, uh, the overheating- no, I think that sounds, I think you were borne out to be correct. So the overheating was very much gener generated by the continuation of the stimulus. And, you know, it's interesting to hear you say, I was in favor of the stimulus because, you know, you've had a history with this. In 2020, of, I was in right, favor right, of the stimulus. Right, right, right. No, no, not but the I, subs, not the, and I was in favor of stimulus in 2020. No, you think at some point. It's not of the stopped. magnitude we had. Right. It could have stopped at some point when the vaccine had, it looked like the economy had self-corrected. But I'm reminded as you were talking about how important it was, you actually in 2008, you know, you rescued the economy from the subprime mortgage crisis. And if I remember reading or talking to you on stage that you were in favor of even more stimulus, you thought at that point they could have used more. So it's interesting how you know how to pump on the brakes 
it's not like you're opposed to government intervention to help uh, market change the market forces. It just it does what you're describing even now. It's just knowing when to turn it off, right? Not at all. Look, I, you know, the, I think it's really important to do arithmetic as well as just discuss uh, directions, uh, Thane. Um, in, I was for, uh, more, from an economic point of view, I was for as much stimulus as we could do in 2009. Right. The limits all had to do with politics. Right. It didn't have to do with uh, how much I thought the economy could absorb. But nobody thought we should do twice as large, certainly not three times as large. I see. Stimulus is what we did. And if you look at the stimulus in uh, 2021, in an economy that was much stronger than the 2009 economy, the stimulus was vastly larger. And so relative to the size of the hole that needed to be filled, I would argue that the stimulus in 2021 was 5x, five times as large. Wow. And I just don't think that was justified by any arithmetic calculation. That's wow. why I was critical at uh, the time. Now, you know, all kinds of other thoughtful people disagreed with me. And I think it is true that we've had substantial inflation, but they might argue that there were other things that caused the inflation. So there's always going to be arguments among economists. But my view was that in an economy with a gap between supply and demand that was perhaps 3%, to do 14% of GDP in stimulus was just a pretty obvious uh, risk-taking act. And unfortunately, those risks panned out. And one of the consequences of that, which I know I think you can maybe explain to the audience and that you're critical of, is what we now have this extraordinary uh, job vacancy and what you call quit rates, which maybe we can explain that a little. The idea here that we've had double-digit pay increases uh, and extraordinary wage growth. Uh, and, you know, we just came out of a pandemic. And I think people are surprised that there's 20% increase in housing costs, that people can leave jobs and double their salaries. This clearly, I think you've said, this is worse than supply chain problems, right? Can you explain why that is for, for inflationary purposes, so, labor costs? So, Thane, wage inflation, wages, are what is the sort of ultimate cost in the economy. Wages in one company affect its price and then that's input to another company. And wages and hiring people are like everything else uh, determined by supply and demand. And when we were pumping all this money into the economy, people wanted to buy lots of stuff. They wanted to go out for lots of uh, meals. They wanted to take uh, lots of uh, trips. And that meant there was lots of demand uh, for labor. And at the same time, as people rethought their lives after COVID, some of them had uh, long uh, COVID, you had a certain amount of quiet quitting, you have a certain amount of the great resignation. So you had this very big imbalance developed between demand and supply. So it wasn't, you're saying, it wasn't economy, just in restaurants, wait, right? Sorry? That they, it wasn't just in restaurants where there. No, it was, it was in. It was in almost. It was. It was analysts working for investment banks and people were quitting. And There's... orderlies working in mental hospitals. Right. I mean, it was. It was software. Software programs and uh, people uh, doing criminal justice work. Whatever. Whatever you uh, looked at. And so, what happens when that's true? Uh, there's a lot of pressure to raise wages. People who have jobs get offers to go take other jobs uh, where they can get higher wages. That raises wage scales. And those higher wages then feed through to costs. And that leads to more inflation. And then the more inflation um, leads uh, 
more wage inflation leads to higher costs of products, and that may feed back into another round of higher wage inflation. And that's what we're trying to make sure that kind of spiral uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't happen and doesn't play out, because if it does, it's going to be that much more expensive uh, to contain. And those numbers dwarf supply chain inflationary pressures, right? That I think they exceed. I, I'm not going to say dwarf, uh-huh. but I think they exceed supply chain. And I think a lot of what people call supply chain is not really supply chain. It's really we had a big increase in demand I and we only had so much capacity to produce. It's not that the capacity to produce declined right. in uh, a number of the areas. So what should the government, I, we know how you feel about the central bank, the Federal Reserve, but what would you, as from a policy perspective, what would you say to the administration are things that can be done that would help us correct our course and ease the pain and reduce the overall inflationary numbers and make, if there is a recession, make it as manageable as possible. What kinds of things can we do to help mitigate some of the pain? I think there's some real limits on what can be done. Uh, in some sense, uh, when your car's going, get, going too fast on an icy hill, you're not going to stop the car without <laughs> a, difficult, uh, a difficult skid. And so I don't want to suggest that there's any kind of silver bullet. I think we can make sure that fiscal policy doesn't overstimulate demand. And I meaning the government that, shouldn't overspend also. Overspend okay. without raising revenue. Right. I think we did that well in uh, the Inflation Reduction uh, Act and did important things for the environment as well. I'm not sure that we are doing it consistently in all of our executive orders, for example, with respect to student uh, loan relief, which is potentially going to put tens of billions of dollars each year uh, into the economy in increased spending. I think there are all kinds of regulations and tariffs that hold prices high that by reducing them could operate in the direction of reducing prices. Why should it be necessary, really, if you're going to carry uh, oil from Houston to Newark to use an American ship rather than the cheapest ship available? If British Airways flies a passenger from uh, London to New York and then flies on to Los Angeles, why shouldn't it be able to pick up passengers in uh, New York? Why shouldn't it be possible to build high-speed, high-powered transmission lines so that we can use solar energy generated in Arizona to heat homes in uh, Nebraska without prohibitive uh, regulatory uh, costs? Do we really need all the tariffs that we are imposing, given that in many cases, what they're doing is raising prices to American consumers or making American exporters less competitive because they have to pay more uh, for uh, their inputs? So there are many examples of this kind. What about strategic- I think we can reduce uh, costs and therefore reduce prices, and that will make a contrib- contribution to reducing inflation. What about given the concerns about the war in Ukraine and the disruption on oil, the strategic petroleum reserves, easing restrictions on drilling, uh, fossil fuel regula- deregulation? Do you think that that's something that would make a difference? You're hearing people say that. Sure. I mean, we are using the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and I think it's been effective. Gasoline prices have come down substantially in uh, the last uh, three months, and I would favor continuing uh, to use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Obviously, if you want to have a Strategic Petroleum Reserve, sometimes you have to release the oil and let oil out, and sometimes you have to refill 
uh, the oil, and when the price gets low enough, it will be time to uh, refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. There was an agreement reached between Senator Manchin and Senator Schumer yeah. and uh, the election. Um, I think it is something that is worth uh, very much uh, doing and that we have to be careful uh, to uh, have to be very careful about which restrictions we remove and not to do damage to the environment. But I think in the current instance, if we accelerate the ability for people to get at oil and natural gas, and even more important, if we accelerate the construction of pipelines to enable uh, the sale of uh, the, the transmission of uh, oil and natural gas, that's even more important than the permitting. I think that would contribute to uh, lower prices. I think it would contribute to more energy security. I think it's the right thing to do. When you were Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration, you were the you you left with the administration. You were the last Treasury Secretary in that during those eight years. My recollection was the American economy was booming, and that Clinton actually presided over an extraordinary uh, uh, growth. By the way, it just reminded me. You know, Paul Volcker was a guest on Folks, and so was Bill Clinton, a guest on Folks. We've had everyone, and we had Larry Summers three times. I'm wondering if you can explain, I suspect you can back me up when you say, Thane, as a matter of fact, when I was the Treasury Secretary, the economy was booming. But so thank you for that. But what has to happen? In other words, does everything have to go right? Do you have to have low interest rates, low in unemployment, low inflation? Or is it possible to have a booming stock market when the economy is humming? Is there nothing wrong or can you actually look at a chart and say, well, these numbers are not great, but overall the economy is great. I, I'm trying to see that whether our audience can understand more about the relationship between the various things that we're facing and have faced in the past. And I'm wondering that, all right, now we're saying inflation is really bad. It's like taking, you know, it's and might require some drugs like chemotherapy because you might have to have some pain in order to reduce that I'm wondering in a great economy, what does it look like? Look, I think it's important to remember, Thane, that for all our problems, I'd rather be playing the economic hand of the United States than the economic hand of any other major country. Really? Certainly not Europe, certainly mm -hmm. not Japan, certainly, certainly not China, given all the difficulties that they have to deal with. So that's the first thing uh, that I would want uh, to emphasize. We have to work through this and it's not gonna be easy to uh, work through, but we've had business cycles, we've had inflation, we've had recessions uh, before. Ultimately, what's most important is to build the productive potential of the economy. And that goes back to fundamental investments in our people, in our capacity to innovate, in our infrastructure. I've been very supportive of the aspirations of the Biden administration to build a new, more modern, uh, more innovation-based uh, uh, economy because I think we've got a kind of capacity for innovation and then uh, implementation that is really very rare in uh, today's world. Hmm. Um, we've got, God, we have so many questions from this global audience. I'm gonna come to them in a second. You did mention China, but before we get to some of these questions from the audience, um, during the Cold War, it was an arms race. And with China, it seems like it's something else. It's like, it's a race to being the world's most powerful economy. And things, you know, we didn't worry about the Soviet Union when it came to them stealing our intellectual property, right? We weren't worried about 
the supply chain problems with the Soviet Union. We were just really worried about bombs. And I'm wondering how serious it is for our economy to no longer be the world's biggest economy. In other words, we keep hearing talk about China is going to catch up and soon overtake us. And I'm wondering, okay, well, what's the significance of that? Is that something that we should stop? Is that essentially an arms race? If they do it, are they doing it fairly? And the consequence for it could be what for our, for our economic prosperity? I'm not sure China is going to surpass us. That really? was a nearly universal view uh, a few years ago. It depends on just what measures uh, you use. But I think uh, China is going to have some very profound challenges. And this is not because of COVID, in right? This years is not. Ahead. COVID has pointed up what some of the challenges are, but they've got immense. Uh, building of empty real estate backed by debt. So the debt doesn't have a very attractive kind of collateral. And as they try to sell those, sell that collateral, the prices of all real estate comes down. And that then has further financial knock-on effects and affects the level of spending uh, in uh, the Chinese uh, economy. So I'm very dubious about how rapidly the Chinese economy is going to grow. I think there's also going to be a tendency over time, given that China is losing attractiveness as an investment destination, is has many people who want to move capital out and uh, is in that kind of situation that the value of the Chinese currency, the renminbi, is likely to decline. Wow. And that, of course, reduces the total dollar value of uh, the Chinese uh, economy. And when they cut interest rates, as they need to do to stimulate the economy at a time when we're raising interest rates, that also reinforces uh, the uh, effects. So I think it's going to be a very difficult uh, and challenging period. For China. Now, it's always a mistake to count them out, uh, given their track record. So before we take some questions from the audience, again, this is an, a lot of questions from the audience. I have one last question. It reminded me of something that you said on stage the last time you were at Folks. We talked about labor markets and future markets. And one of the things that you said, and that you had already been president of Harvard University, and you said, well, you know, people have to learn to collaborative work. I don't know if you remember talking about this. You said future economies are going to need to work together. And students are learning that in universities of having students work together to solve problems and that workers are going to eventually have to do that as well. And I can tell you, Larry, that during the pandemic, I thought of you because I thought, wait a minute, this messes up everything Larry Summers was saying. We're being told that we should be working from home because <laughs> we have to. And I'm wondering the, what you were describing before, the problem with the quit rates. It seems like we're, we're hearing that Apple's having problems getting people to come in. Now we're having three-day work weeks, two-day work weeks. As an economist who believed in the notion of people together working together, does collaborative work, if everybody's working at home, does it, is that still have the same uh, potential value that you seem to think was necessary? In other words, it seems like the labor market has changed dramatically, not just because wages are doubling or because people are quitting to take different jobs. It's because they don't want to show up. And I wonder whether you think that there will have some economic consequences to that. I Look, we'll have to see how it all shakes out on uh, work at home versus work in the office. Uh, I'd be surprised, very surprised if the world goes back to where it was. In hmm. terms of the volume of collaboration, I actually suspect that the ubiquity of Zoom has, <laughs> and similar technologies means that there's vastly more capacity for cooperation Good point. because it makes distance much less of an issue if people wanna collaborate on a paper or hold yeah. a meeting. And my observation would be that there's much more collaborative hmm. uh, activity uh, than there used to be. And so 
I stand by my statement that when I completed my PhD thesis, it was the last important thing I did in my life where I was going to succeed or fail alone. Wow. Rather <laughs> than do it in uh, collaboration uh, with, uh, with others. And it's interesting. I think that's true for many, many people. And I think it's a skill we need to nurture from the very beginning of education uh, onwards. It's certainly something I try to do in my teaching. It's actually a very good insight, Larry, as usual, because Microsoft's uh, platform is called Teams, right? So that the understanding yeah. is just, just because you're not in the same room, if you're on Teams, it means you're part of a team. So it's a good insight, Larry, that, that, may, that the work at home doesn't necessarily present challenges to collaborative work. All right, let's start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, this comes from someone named Ted Covey, who says, inflation is a worldwide problem. So can the United States inflation be cured only by using U.S. monetary and fiscal policy? Does not a global problem require more international action? I think it mostly can be cured um, by our policies. Uh, first of all, we have been important drivers of the global inflation. Our demand has created the bottlenecks that have pushed prices up globally. And our very strong dollar has meant weaker currencies abroad and weaker currencies abroad mean higher prices and uh, more uh, inflation. So if we control ours, that'll help control inflation around the globe. Second, uh, there's no reason why if we run relatively restrictive policies and others don't, the dollar can't go up further and that will mean that whatever the inflation rate is in their country, it won't be translating into higher inflation rates uh, in uh, the United States. So obviously what happens depends on what happens globally, but I think for the most part with respect to inflation, we hold our destiny in our own hands. This comes to us from an anonymous attendee, and this is a, an interesting question. It might even require some math skills. Uh, even with the COVID and Ukraine war, should the Fed have gone to near zero rates instead of stopping at one or 2%? Did they not learn from Japan, which had zero rates and was in a recession for decades? With one or 2% instead of zero, the stock market may have only doubled instead of tripled, and you did not destroy the savers or elderly on fixed income. Sophisticated question. It is, and I'm not sure. I mean, the questioner is saying that before all this stuff happened, maybe we should have brought, in plate, brought the interest rate down less um, and not brought it down all the way to zero. On the other hand, before this recent episode, the economy's problem was, if anything, too little inflation rather than too much. And so in that context, it seemed natural to people to bring down uh, the level of interest rates. I think that's a matter that's gonna be much debated. Europe, as you know, um, had negative interest rates and has now ended it's negative interest right. rate policies. And I'm gonna be interested to see how economic historians judge it. I am someone who like your questioner is pretty worried about whether reducing interest rates below a certain point, I wonder whether the benefits really do exceed the costs. This comes to us from uh, Dr. John Shore from Nevada. And he says, should we make more things in the United States? Would that help? I think in general, we should try to get things as inexpensively as we can. Inexpensive. We're inexpensively. And if we're the lowest cost producer, then we should make things in the United States. And if it's a thing where there's a central concern with our national security, we should make sure that either through diversification or something else, that we have a satisfactory uh, set of uh, availability of uh, supply, but I don't think 
per se, we should say that everything should be produced in the United States. Can we, all right, before I get last question, I have, let me ask, can we talk a little about politics? I'm curious. So you served in two democratic administrations. Um, it does seem as if the Democratic Party is focusing both for the midterm and maybe for the next presidential election away from the economy, focusing on abortion and racial justice and climate change. And it seems like the Republicans are the ones that are talking about the economy, rising prices, crime, immigration. Uh, you know, you served two Democratic administrations that had two terms each. So obviously you know how to work within the executive branch. And although you don't run for office, you, you know, you seem to hang out with people who know how to win elections. I mean, you've been good at it. You, you, these people, it happens, they, some of them were teach students of yours at Harvard. <laughs> um, but it turns out that, you know, I'm wondering as a member of the Democratic Party, who's such a leading American, if not world economist, do you think the Democratic Party is making a mistake and not focusing more on the economy? You know, I will leave uh, political strategy to uh, <laughs> I knew you'd say that. political strategists. I think the orientation of the president towards infrastructure and innovation has been uh, a very welcome one. And I think it will yield a substantial uh, economic benefits. I think we may be living in a moment when there's just a red hot character to cultural issues that lead them sometimes to take center stage. But I think that progressive economics has an enormous amount uh, to uh, contribute both to making the society richer and even more important to widening the availability of opportunities. All right, before we say goodnight to Larry, I have one comment I have to offer from one of our board chairs. Uh, it's a compliment for you, Larry, and I wanna just read it. He says, around nine months ago, you were asked how you thought the record negative spread between inflation and yields would be resolved. Uh, you replied that if you were a trader, you would short the bond market. And, he, and this is from Joe Feshback, who's one of our board chairs. He said, great call. <laughs> Well, uh, sometimes I get them right, and sometimes <laughs> I uh, get them wrong in terms of what's going to happen in the markets. But I do hope that everybody can try to think through all of this uh, very carefully, because I think the economic changes we make in the next few years will be enormously consequential. Well, Larry, you gave us a lot to think of. Before we say goodnight, I think we have one quick announcement. Where are we? We have an upcoming event. Yes, a new book from another friend of ours. Uh, Dahlia Lithwick, there it is, her new book, Lady, Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Uh, Dahlia is a legal correspondent for Slate. She's a senior writer there, and she's uh, an analyst, legal analyst at MSNBC. And also, like Larry, Summer is a longtime friend of folks. And uh, of course, we're a nonprofit, uh, so we're, we like to think we're among your favorite charities. Throughout the pandemic, we haven't charged for tickets, and we've picked up a global audience, but we're, we're really happy to come to you. We're happy that so many of you watched us on YouTube and through our own station. Uh, and of course, if you're not signed up yet for folks.org, go to folks.org and sign up for our mailing list. Larry, I wanna thank you for being as always such a terrific friend and such a first rate mind and really raising the level of, 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 of intelligence for everyone, but especially tonight, I think everyone walks away always hoping to feel a little smarter. And tonight, because of you, I think we took a really senior seminar in economics. So thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Good night, everyone. Good I'm Thane Rosen Rosenbaum for folks. Good night, Larry. Thank you.